So we're going to go ahead and get started. Okay, good. Cool. All right. So hi, everyone. Thank you for joining Data LA 2021. And welcome to the Data for Good track. My name is Joanna Perlomo, your host, and our co-host today is Manuel Das, and we're going to be moderating the chat and Q&A for you during the session. Today we have our guest, Cindy Lin, and they will be talking about data equity and ethics from idea to practice. Cindy Lin has years of experience in the fields of data and product. In their current role as senior data product manager at Hopskip Drive, they focus on improving employee data uh, and data-driven decision-making and access to information for customers. Throughout their career, they've made complex information and insights accessible to colleagues and customers, yielding positive results across numerous industries, including gaming, social media, research and manufacturing by applying the set of data principles and product management tenets. And without further ado, I'll hand it over to our speaker. Thanks for being here, Cindy. Thank you so much, Joanna. Um, yes, thank you everyone for joining us here today. I'm so excited to be part of DataCon LA um, and to be, be presenting. So um, as uh, you know, as we're talking about here, um, Yes, first of all, hello, my name is Cindy Lynn, Senior Data Product Manager at Hopskip Drive, and we're going to be talking about how we take the ideas behind data equity and ethics and put them into practice, um, and why that's so powerful, um, not just to know something, but to actually do something about it, um, and how we did it specifically at Hopskip Drive, and some lessons that I've learned, so hopefully help you. Um, implement it at your organization. And so before we jump into what we did at Hopskip Drive, let's just do some level setting, right? Data is powerful, right? We're all here because we're data practitioners. We believe in the power of data. Um, but as some guy once said, with great power comes some great responsibility. And so as data is really becoming the language that we use across business, across, across governments, um, it's really important to understand and we've probably all experienced this, where you've used data to tell one story over another, right? And um, whether or not that's the right story, that's accurate, whether that's the story that we wanna be telling, um, we really need to be cognizant about how this intersects with some of the issues we've been grappling with as a society. Really the stakes couldn't be higher. Um, when we think about um, how we analyze or present data, whether or not it's intentional, we could be compounding existing biases that already um, limit access to people already at the margins. Um, and so when we think about things like um, facial recognition software that is based on, um, that uses machine learning and data input by, um, and, and the data that's being input, how that affects the things like how accurate it is in recognizing different faces. Um, when we find out that it's more accurate at recognizing white faces than black ones, think about how that could have an impact when it comes to if that software is being used by police departments, right? Um, we could be arresting, leading to many more false arrests for those who are black versus those who are white, and just how that can compound existing societal issues um, for people of that background. Um, so let's make sure that we're not using data um, in that way. And let's instead try and figure out how we can use that tool to underline how deep some oppression goes, right? The, the last Data for Good speaker really talked about, um, I was really impressed with just how um, we were able to do this in this way, right? Talk about how um, we're starting to see these trends around things like anti-Asian hate and the data behind that so we can really understand how that oppression um, uh, surfaces. So, um, so that's why we're talking about this, right? And so when it comes to the actual concepts of data ethics and data equity, um, I, I wanted to just kind of outline what I think these, these are um, based on uh, uh, things I found um, that I think really capture the, the definitions pretty accurately. So for data ethics, um, this um, comes from HBS's online blog. Um, it encompasses the moral obligations of gathering, protecting, and using personally identifiable information and how it affects individuals. It asks, is this the right thing to do? Can we do better? Right? So we want to be thinking about how we are, um, we are doing the right thing when it comes to using data. And so the right thing I think can sometimes be ambiguous if you don't define it. And so I think that's where data equity um, adds another um, uh, add some additional detail and color to help us define what that right thing is to do. And so for data equity, um, I pulled this from data or uh, JL Consulting. Um, 
It refers to the consideration through an equity lens of how the ways in which data is collected, analyzed, interpreted, and distributed. It underscores marginalized communities' unequal opportunities to access data and at times their harms from data misuse. And so there's two things that I pulled from that definition that I really uh, wanted to call out, right? The first is all the different ways that data is analyzed or is data is used. We're talking about collection, analysis, analysis, interpretation, and distribution, and thinking about how um, the concepts that we're going to be talking about, how uh, and the issues that we're facing as a society, how they may present in each one of those different stages of data use. Um, and then the second piece is just targeting who we're fighting for, who we're doing this for. We're talking about um, those that are marginalized and making sure that they are, we're not helping perpetuate existing societal gaps. And so why does this matter, right? Well, this matters because like I said, we're using data all the time to make decisions that will inevitably impact our users. And user bases are not monolithic, right? They are made up of diverse groups of individuals. And those individuals come from all different backgrounds. And so when you think about how certain issues affect people of a certain background, it probably will surface somehow in your user base. And so thinking about then how you accurately understand how you can effectively address those issues because you're able to define what those issues are, how the experience is for um, different people and different groups within your overall user base are experiencing the service that you're doing, the product that you're making and understanding what is happening there and just making sure that you can minimize discrimination or again, prevent perpetuation of existing societal gaps, right? So that's why this topic is so important. And that's why, you know, I think there's a few different sessions at DataCon LA that talk about this topic in particular. And so the, the thing that I think I can add to this conversation is just how do we take these ideas and put them into practice? And so that's what we did at Hopskip Drive. Um, we we um, had we understood that these things were important, but we didn't really have a way to integrate it into the things that we were already working on, um, on a whole scale. Maybe individually, we were all kind of, um, some of us were more aware than others about how these issues affect one another, but we really wanna be thoughtful about how it, how we um, roll this out across the company, right? So, um, and I really like this quote from Daisy Auger Dominguez, who just said, um, awareness without action means nothing, right? We can understand what these topics and what these issues mean overall, but we really need to do something about it. We need to take change our actions, change the way that we do things, because if we don't do it, the people who are affected by this stuff is just going to continue to be affected. We wanna be um, making sure that we're helping the helping those individuals, um, not, not continuing on um, the way that things have been. And so um, to set some context here about where, where and how this is implemented. Um, I think it's important to understand a little bit about Hopskip Drive. So if you don't know, Hopskip Drive is an LA-based technology startup. Um, we're focused on creating mobility for, uh, I'm sorry, creating opportunity for all through ability. Um, what this means is we're connecting riders, mainly students that need transportation with our network of care drivers on our technology platform. We're working with schools, parents, government agencies to transport um, these individuals. And our rider population is actually made up of mostly um, rider or youth experiencing homelessness, um, youth in foster care, or youth with specialized education needs. So that's a large part of the um, rider base that we're serving. So you can kind of even start to imagine how some of these concepts may, uh, may intersect with those user bases uh, or those individuals. The second piece, um, or so, yeah. The second piece is that Hopskip Drive not only is a mission-driven organization or a data-driven one. Um, if you were at my DataCon talk last year, you may recall that my main responsibility as the data product manager for the organization is thinking about our data culture and making sure that we're um, in, in, in charge of implementing, evolving, leveling up that data culture with the ultimate goal of helping our employees and our customers be empowered with the data that they need so they can make smarter, more informed decisions 
about the things they have to make decisions on. And so it's really important to, um, to understand that these are kind of both the, the things that we're dealing with when it comes to implementing um, data equity and ethics at Hopskip Drive. Now, uh, a little piece of, of just what this looks like, the data culture at Hopskip Drive, there's um, three kind of elements of it that are important to kind of call out, which is we have dashboards and reporting to help facilitate the, the information, getting the information out there so people have it at their fingertips. Training so people are able to analyze and assess and make decisions off of that information and start to communicate with that. And just data visibility along those processes. So making it transparent where data is being used, how it's being used to make these different decisions. And I call this out again because these are the ways in which we, or the areas where we really need to be thoughtful about how these issues of data equity and ethics can present so that we're making sure we're providing the most accurate um, picture as possible, while also not contributing to some of the um, pitfalls that might exist when it comes to working on these topics. And so finally, just why, right? Why, why, why do we do this at Hopskip Drive? Um, I think making smart decisions includes being informed about how these societal issues impact our user bases, right? When we think about who it is that we're um, working with, um, it's not so cut and dry as to say, you know, again, all care drivers all look this way and they all experience the platform the same way. They might experience it a little bit differently, especially if you're black, if you're um, a trans individual, you know, like those are things that may affect how you move about this world and may affect how you um, interact with our platform. And so it's important that we understand that so we can address that um, when it comes to building out the services and product that we build out. Um, and again, um, our users are more vulnerable and more marginalized compared to the typical rideshare users. So we really want to be aware of how these issues affect them, right? And so when we're talking about unhoused youth, youth in foster, youth in foster care, students with specialized education plans, and even older adults, which is uh, has been um, a, a user base that has been growing for Hopskill Drive, especially during the pandemic, thinking about their access to transportation and how that might affect their needs and the, the, the solutions that we build out for them, as well as non-binary individuals. This is another group that we've started to focus a little bit more on compared to, I think, um, other rideshare platforms, right? Other competitors of ours and thinking about how we continue to help and service them compared to, you know, your standard person who's using a Lyft or an Uber. So um, where did we get started? Well, I got started with the organization that's, um, I see, I think Karen's on, so um, the, that she's a part of, that she's founded and is the executive um, director of the LA Tech for Good runs a data equity and ethics workshop that I took in December of last year. Um, and it was fantastic. And I learned so much there about, you know, these topics in a lot of detail, as well as tactics to mitigate against, um, against when we run into these issues. And so I kind of came out of that thinking, wow, we really need this at Hop, Skip, Drive. And that's really the foundation. There was so much resources, lots of discussion, and it was just so valuable to hear from people who are also data professionals thinking about these topics and how it affects the work that they're doing. And just coming away with, we really need this on Hop, Skip, Drive. And then also understanding, I'm the person who's in charge of data culture at Hop, Skip, Drive. It's my responsibility to implement it, right? So that was kind of the foundation. And from there, we went into our, I kind of came up with um, an initial rollout plan for how, how we wanted to do this, just some idea of like how I want to approach this problem. So the first was running a pilot. Um, this was a for those of you in the product world, this is you know the same as having an MVP. We want to um, demonstrate the value of this work. We want to test the goals that we have um, and establish just how we want to run this. What's the viability of the structure? What's working? What's not working? From there, we had a company rollout um, where we were. This is where we really introduced these key concepts through open and thoughtful conversations about how these concepts really already intersect with the data that we're using to make the decisions that we have to make. Um, and is there any changes that we need to make kind of immediately? And how do we continue thinking about this long term? And finally, the readout, right? So I think this is just as important as everything else here, which was it's really important to share what these discussion groups learned amongst the rest of the company, because 
even though the topics are the same, the concepts are the same, I think the ways that they present themselves, the way these different teams think about these topics are different. And it's helpful to understand just how different it is and just making sure that we're all kind of aligned on the same page moving forward about what data equity and ethics at Hopscape Drive looks like, right? And so um, in, in moving into the pilot, there is some pre-pilot preparation. I say that three times fast. Um, and the first was just to establish the goals, right? What are the goals for this project? How do these goals align with the data team's ex existing data culture strategy, right? If we're, if we have this kind of overall initiative, how does this kind of line up in the other things we're doing to make sure that everyone is, um, has the ability to make data-driven decisions? Um, how can we kind of emphasize that there? From there, um, I went and got an executive sponsor. So this is the person who needs to sign off on this project. I was going to be dedicating work time to this, like a lot of work time to this. And so I needed to make sure that like, yeah, I had approval to be spending our time on this versus on something else. And so it was both my manager and my boss or uh, and his manager needed to be involved in part of that, as part of that conversation. And then the executive sponsor also, helped, also offered um, help when it came to providing guidance around what next steps are, especially when working with teams I don't normally work with at this level. Um, so making sure that like they can provide advice about, you know, how to approach this topic and just be an advocate for when you're not there. These conversations, uh, this, the project rose all the way to the executive level. And so it was important that they, um, I had someone who was advocating for this project in that space, um, because I'm obviously not invited to those conversations. Um, and so this wound up being um, the senior VP of product. Um, so my boss's boss. And then finally, I just wanted a thought partner, someone who could help me work through kind of the more detailed questions, um, thinking through like how many people to include from which teams, that kind, those types of questions to help make sure that we can answer um, so that I could work through kind of the problems. Because this is something we've never done at the company. And so we needed to kind of like think through what the best way to do it was. And I also wanted someone who had a little bit of a different perspective, because one thing I've kind of learned in doing all of this work is that the the uniqueness that other people bring to a project like this adds so much more than if I was just kind of thinking about this on my own for 10 hours. Just having a 30 minute conversation can be so much more illuminating about how any of this stuff. So um, I think just having someone else who can add new perspectives can really enhance everything. Um, and so this wound up being our um, people ops manager. She was very helpful in helping me think through this stuff. So moving into the goals, what did I establish as the goals for this project? So there's really four of them. The first was just introducing these topics, highlight how issues of equity and ethics present themselves when using data. So just laying it out and sharing to everyone, here are the things that we need to be thinking about. Second is just inspiring them to just start to consider these when they're working with data. So when you're inter when you're interacting with data, when you're deciding what data to collect, when you're deciding what data to present, how are these topics showing up and how can we be thoughtful about the information that's being shared? Next is providing those tools to employ um, in order to minimize those equity and ethical issues when they are encountered. So again, you know, awareness without action means nothing we need to be able to do something about it and so providing those solid tools about how to solve these problems um, was also an essential piece of um, this training and finally i wanted to identify how we move forward following this right because it's one time to have an initial thing um, but it's another thing to just continue to make sure that it's a part of the work that we continue to do this is not just uh, i want this to be something that's like hey here it is. We're never going to talk about this again, right? I really wanted it to be something that we integrated into the overall data culture at Hopskip Drive. So when we talk, um, once we kind of established those goals, was able to get a pilot together. And so there's some um, essential features of the of the pilot that um, wind up carrying through the rest of the project. Um, so let's just the structure. I recruited seven participants from a mix of um, different teams and backgrounds. So again, the importance of having different perspectives was kind of the thing I was focusing on here. Um, I shared about 30 minutes worth of pre-session readings and videos to review um, as part of the workshop um, with LA Tech for Good. Uh, there was um, so much 
so many resources that were provided that did a better job explaining these concepts than I could ever. So I definitely leaned on them um, more in order to do that. And, and also just acknowledging that some people learn differently. You know, lecturing doesn't always work for everyone. So providing that where possible. Provided, um, I prepared five different topics with some relevant work examples, discussion questions, and mitigation tactics so that we could, you know, that's how we wanted to prepare that conversation. And then um, ultimately had a one hour session that I moderated um, and then sent up a follow up survey afterwards. And so I think all of these are important to kind of um, when I was going through this, because they all served a purpose, right? I wanted to make sure that there was um, already kind of a base level set with the pre-session. We had a mix of people. We had some fodder to talk about. And we also wanted to collect feedback so we can evaluate the success of this pilot and figure out what we needed to change um, in, before we scaled to the entire company. And so there were some, definitely some strengths and weaknesses that came out of that. Um, the, the strengths were definitely that the pre-session materials was super helpful. Um, the examples really grounded the topics in the work that we were doing. And so it really helped um, uh, anchor the, the, the concepts themselves. The small group size is great. Um, definitely appreciated having discussion in that small group. Um, interest in working beyond the pilot um, in, on this work. So great that it, you know, people were aligned with me that this is not just a one-time thing. We wanted to continue working on this. And then there was also um, the fact that there was representation from those different teams added a lot of value to the conversation. It helped not only um, anchor the, the concepts themselves, but one thing I heard that I was really, um, I, was, I was surprised by was the fact that it helped individuals understand the business more too, not just, um, not just how these topics, um, and not just the topics themselves, but actually the business. So um, already having some real world business um, value um, for that. As far as the weaknesses go, it was too much to cover. Five topics um, <laughs> with discussions, examples, um, and uh, just some really needy areas to cover was just too much in an hour, one hour period. Um, so that was definitely the most consistent piece of feedback we got. Um, there was no fellow team members to discuss solutions. So on the other side of like having different teams being involved in this conversation, um, I, I love my coworkers are great. One, and I think part one of the reasons that they're great is that they're always trying to solve problems. And so um, when we brought up these issues, um, the natural instinct was to figure out, okay, how do we, how do we fix this, right? Um, unfortunately, there was no one else from their teams that were there to kind of discuss solutions. And so it was very much like, this is a problem and that's it. And we can figure out how we want to solve it afterwards. So um, that was definitely something that came out of that discussion. And then the examples were really not all relevant to those that were present. Um, and I think that that kind of goes back to the, the previous one. We had examples around writers, around care drivers. Um, but if you don't work with either of those groups, then you know maybe it's not, it, it's not as grounding as if you had something that was so particular to the work that you were doing. And so um, kind of looking these over, it, it became apparent to me kind of how we wanted to move forward. So once we had the pilot, we were able to do the company rollout and um, the, the lessons learned, the readout to the entire org. So um, when we're thinking about then how we scaled these small conversations, we were um, moving into uh, sessions that would be grouped by team. Um, and it was one hour scheduled with the whole team. So um, obviously, kind of thinking about that feedback about wanting to have the ability to solve these problems and having really particular examples to the work that you're doing. It just seemed like it made more sense to have these uh, sessions grouped by team. And then we would, um, and then we could do the readout afterwards, or we could share the lessons learned. And so people can learn from the other teams. So that was the first change that we made. The second change is that we changed it so that we only picked two teams for each team or two themes for each team. Um, and we, I collaborated with the team leader in order to figure out what those two themes would be, as well as pick out some really relevant examples based on the work that that team is doing. So that um, it was, again, really grounded and we could have really meaty discussions about those um, concepts for those teams. 
I would kick off each theme as the moderator, but would quickly then open up the floor for discussion um, and just record notes and action items. Um, I really wanted the teams to discuss and just kind of jump in um, where it was possible and maybe be the bad guy when um, uh, there were definitely some ideas that were a little more antiquated that came up. And so pushing back on those um, concepts and making sure that we were thoughtful about how we um, think about these things and how it, um, those some of those concepts might perpetuate some of those um, societal gaps that we were we already have um, and how we can move forward from those. And then finally, identify how these teams wanted to engage in order to um, wanted to continue to engage with these issues. Again, there was interest in continuing them, uh, continuing this conversation, continuing this work. And so we wanted to make sure that there was um, it made the most sense for the way that our um, company is structured. Right. And so kind of having that framework for how I wanted to run um, this company-wide, uh, the company-wide rollout. I then went to our leadership team um, in order to get their buy-in. So it was uh, important that, you know, I worked with those teams because oftentimes these were the team leaders I needed to collaborate with in order to pick out those topics that we wanted to talk about. And so that was really important, but also, you know, I was going to be taking up company time um, for everyone in the company um, and also taking up time to do the readout. So this is a really big initiative that we wanted to make sure everyone across the organization was really bought in on. And so um, went to uh, uh, kind of the leadership to, to present and to get their approval. And thankfully, all thumbs up, we were good to go. And again, that's where the executive sponsor became really helpful because he helped me with thinking through how to position this, how to uh, approach the conversation so that we could get a yes. Um, and so in total, we had six discussions. We had total team, six total team discussions. Um, some context here about Hoskett Drive. At the time, we were about a 50-person company. So, you know, uh, there wasn't a, there was maybe like a little less than 10 people on average in each group. So it was still a pretty small team group discussion. Um, and so we kind of had it by team. So you can see here, front end engineering, marketing, sales, we had our marketplace, which is what we call our driver supply and balancing team, as well as legal put together, safety and support, and finance and people ops. So you can kind of see how these teams were organized in order to facilitate the conversation um, to be as best as possible. And so once we had these conversations, which I think were so tremendously valuable, um, and I was so lucky to be able to sit in on all of these um, and facilitate them, you know. I just wanted to share what all these teams had learned. And so um, we had already agreed that we would do this in a, a company-wide forum, but having reflected upon the actual discussions themselves, I'm so grateful that we um, had a, you know, decided that we were going to do this from the outset to do this company-wide sharing. Um, and so what I asked from each discussion group was to have one person from each group um, come in and talk about the uh, the discussion that they have talk about uh, across these and using these um, three questions is kind of a framing device for asking for for kind of talking about the discussion. The first was talking about one or two examples about how those themes related to the work that the team does. Um, two, what were some of the concerns raised during that discussion? And three, what were the next steps that your team has identified as a result of the discussion? Right, anchoring what they had learned in the the work that they have to do, as well as raising some, what are those concerns that are raised? You know, how are the, where are we in conflict and how did we resolve them and just figuring out how we want to move forward. Um, and demonstrating to to all one of, there were definitely some concepts that um, came up across the different teams pretty consistently. So that was really interesting for me, again, to hear them talk about this, these concepts that were pretty consistent and then having them kind of share that and seeing everyone um, and having everyone experience that same experience for themselves, right? Hearing um, these same topics around, um, sorry, uh, these same areas that we were working on and how one team might view it versus another so that we all can kind of see, we all have these different perspectives and how that might be and where are we all coming from around this? So it was really great. So that was kind of the initial rollout. And so once we, you know, kind of finished off with the uh, um, with that initial kickoff, it was important that we again figure out how we continue the work. And so um, what this has really turned into is a working group. Um, so following that initial 
kind of roll out across the company. We had a working group. We established a working group that meets monthly to really work on those action items that came out of those initial team discussions. And so we've had some achievements, which I'm really happy with and proud of, and we're just continuing to move forward on these. But the first that I want to call out is um, we changed one of our care driver um, uh, for our applicants, for our hopefuls, that is, um, when they are submitting um, their application, there was a few fields that really required written responses in English. And once they're on the platform, one of the things that we realized is that being able to write in English is not that important. We want to be able to make sure that they have um, verbal English um, proficiency. And so we switched over to a video response option instead of con um, continuing the written one so that, you know, as we're um, thinking about who has access to this platform, we're really making sure it is, it is as accessible as possible to all care drivers, uh, all potential care drivers who meet the requirements. Um, similar, we, we, we looked at caregiver criteria definitions um, in order to be a care driver on the Hopskip Drive platform. We want to make, we require um, caregiving experience, but I think, you know, caregiving experience should not just be limited to being a parent, right? So rethinking about um, are the caregiver definitions, the, the criteria, is it as um, inclusive as it can be? to include all the different ways someone can be a caregiver that we um, you know, deem acceptable. So we did relook at that and just make sure that it was um, as inclusive as possible. And finally, highlighting um, non-binary gender identities for both care drivers and writers. For a long time, um, these are just in the binary, just male, female. And so it was important to us too that we call out how we think about um, it, being inclusive and including non-binary um, gender options for both these different user groups because, I mean, it affirms them, it provides a place for them to um, express themselves fully, which um, especially when we think about our writers, we want them to feel safe. There's been studies that show that um, youth under 18 who are affirmed by an adult are 50% less likely, or sorry, um, queer youth who are affirmed as an adult are 50% less likely to commit suicide. Um, or attempt suicide. So that was such a, you know, if we can be a part of that solution, wow, you know, how much value we can add to um, just making sure that there are so many beautiful humans in this world. So um, that was all um, a big part of it. And there's a lot of nuance here about how we approach these topics. There's a lot of research that we did, especially around our non-binary gender identities and making sure it was inclusive, but um, that was work that we, um, was important to do. And then it was important for us to introduce these concepts to new employees. So sharing these concepts um, in data trainings, um, as if you Google Hop, Skip, Drive, you'll see that we've grown pretty significantly. We've raised a new round, and so we're hiring like crazy. Um, and so we want to make sure that as new employees come on, they're also introduced to these topics. And then because they have little context for how this data is being used for their role once they start, we do a follow-up six months after they started to really cement these concepts. And then also integrating them into um, more advanced data trainings where appropriate. So that's what we've done at Hopskip Drive. Um, I hope it inspires you to kind of think about how you might be implementing this at your organization. I do have some ideas for or implementing because I think a 50 person mission driven startup operates a little bit differently than some a larger organizations. And so some advice is just thinking about maybe how this might align with some existing DNI initiatives at your company, right? Most of the times I think DNI initiatives run um, more internally, but in external is important as well. And so thinking about how you're uh, making sure that those initiatives um, not just carry across internal employees, but for your users. You can obviously break down those groups um, when you have a large single department into multiple small groups, or you can even position it as professional development. Like I mentioned, there was um, uh, concepts where talking about this stuff really cemented these ideas for our um, for other employees about how the business runs. And so that was really um, kind of key. I'm running long. I'm almost done, I promise. Uh, and so to, to finish off, um, I just really want to plug again the data equity and ethics or the equity and ethics and data workshop run by LA Tech for Good. And then there's also a, a panel session tomorrow that I highly recommend if this is of interest to you, just hearing how others kind of think about this and just um, how they've kind of implemented it in practice. Um, so. Um, 
I would love to hear from you. Um, if you have barriers that exist um, for implementing them at your org, please definitely connect with me. I'm, I'm interested to hear how like the, the different things are, are out there that people are experiencing. Um, I'm gonna go to the last word. We're hiring a data analyst at Hopscape Drive. So if you're interested, let me know. But um, we'll finish off with questions. So thank you, Cindy. So there's a couple of questions in the Q&A. So from Catherine, Catherine wants to know, what are some ways that you work on being informed on the societal issues that impact your user base? It's a great question. So, I mean, we already know some of the ways that um, uh, we, obviously the user bases that we've talked about, right? Youth experiencing homelessness, youth in foster care, being connected with the organizations that focus on those issues and talking with them um, was really important um, in order to understand some of this stuff. Uh, so, and then um, I, I mentioned this briefly, but um, thinking about non-binary care, uh, sorry, non-binary gender options and reaching out to um, organizations that have done research, have done thinking about this. Um, we worked with one in Colorado. They've been, they were super helpful as well as um, trans Latina coalition in LA. Um, and just their, um, their perspectives on the issues and just other concerns that we hadn't thought of was a, a really important way where we were able to kind of not only stay aware of um, those issues, but as we start to think about it, things that we need to consider in order to ensure the safety of, of those um, individuals on the in the on the platform. And then we have a more, um, I guess, practical question from Derek. So how are you able to follow up on action items after the initial session while balancing all the regular priorities employees face day to day? Yeah, so I think part of that was figuring out the right cadence for the um, for the working group. <clears throat> we initially planned it for it to be monthly. And um, the, so we ran the um, implementation in like the February, March timeframe. Um, and then things got busy. We're an organization that focuses on getting kids to school. And so ba this back to school has been kind of hectic. And so, yeah, I think we have to be, you know, thoughtful about what we're asking of people to improve the the platform when we're just trying to survive. So the, not survive, that's an exaggeration, but we're just trying to make sure that like we can um, keep up with operations as they're rapidly changing and kids are going back to school. So, um, you know, I, I, as someone who is very kind of keyed into the priorities of the business, um, one thing that I just, you know, when it didn't make sense for us to meet, I just decided that it was not appropriate for us to meet. So this past month, we were supposed to meet, but we were all dealing with the operational challenges of going back to school. And so we just said, you know what, we'll take a pause on it this week. This week, this work continues, but you know, we need to make sure that like, we can just make sure that kids can get to school. So I think it's, it's a little bit of that. But I think the fact that the company is a mission-driven organization in the first place does help a lot with that, with making sure that this is not only um, not seen as something that's not a part of the day-to-day -day, uh, responsibilities of uh, the employees. And I think that that's something that connecting it with the larger data culture initiative, um, where it is everyone's responsibilities to be using data, data for um, decision-making, making sure that these concepts were also connected to that because that is just a piece of using data for um, decision making. So I think that that was a, a, something I would emphasize there. And we only have a couple of minutes left. So I was wondering, Cindy, if you had any last words that you wanted to leave the audience with before we close out the session. Yeah, I think it's, um, if you have the ability to, um, so I'll say it can be really intimidating trying to obviously implement this across your org. If you don't have a role like mine where you have, you're responsible for this area, at least try and figure out what you can do to, to do, um, to practice data equity and ethics in the data that you're in, in your data practice yourself. And then, you know, definitely share that with the people who you're working with so that you can kind of um, expand the people who are thinking about these topics so that eventually, you know, if you do get into a position or you have enough people who are bought into this, you can convince whoever you need to convince that this is something that entire orgs need to be doing. And with that, 
we'll close out the session. So thank you so much, Cindy, for your presentation and for the questions from our attendees. You can contact the speaker directly, and Karen has also posted information in the chat if you're interested in learning more about LA Tech for Good. Uh, and please provide your feedback using the form in the chat box that will drop in momentarily. Uh, thank you again, and enjoy the rest of your time at DataCon LA. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate your attendance. All right. Thank you. See ya. Bye. Bye.